Um, yeah, I, I was uh, thinking for a while what exactly uh, uh, what topic I should choose, and I thought uh, I should actually talk about syntax, which is a very dangerous topic to talk about. Uh, so let me first give you a little bit uh, an, of an idea of, of my motivation uh, or the context of all this. So one of the things that we see these days is everybody, uh, more and more people want to compute uh, uh, bigger and bigger problems. Uh, and clearly more and more people want to uh, use bigger and more hefty and more powerful machines to do that. Um, and these people are typically not the, the, uh, the HPC experts from 30 years ago because the HPC experts from 30 or maybe 50 years ago uh, were specialist programmers that were concerned with one problem essentially that knew the hardware in and out and uh, you know we're happy to do that uh, and to focus on that but today uh, because a lot of compute power becomes available for all kinds of researchers these people just want to leverage machines that are there and they don't necessarily want to know too much about the architecture and it's also not very good to know too much about the architecture because well you may not know which architecture you want to execute your software on. You know, while in 30 years ago, it was rather clear if you, if you want to execute it on a supercomputer, you have lots of lots of machines that are interconnected, typically use MPI. Uh, these nodes may have multiple cores, uh, but that's it. Uh, it's the same kind of hardware everywhere. But today you just execute something on Amazon Cloud or somewhere else, and you just don't want to know about it. So the question is, how do these application programmers really get their applications going there? And, and that is, is, is really a challenge because they typically do not really want to know how this is being done. Um, and uh, as a consequence, we see that people start using things like MATLAB, uh, uh, start using just tools for convenience, and that means it becomes important how expressive your language is, how can you express things in your language, and then how do you get it down on your architecture. Now, if you look at people that are concerned with their algorithms and algorithms only, then it's very easy. We could just look at uh, what kind of papers these people produce when they write up what they do. Right. And if you look at that, then you see that they all love to use some form of tensor notation. Right. I have just uh, almost arbitrarily picked uh, some formula that I found in some papers uh, across, the, uh, uh, across the spectrum. Some of them are from physics here, others are from mathematical papers. Others are from business papers, and they all have these funny formula. And if you look at these funny formulas, so to speak, funny in the sense that they are optically appealing, optically appealing, they typically do not even bother to specify the ranges of their indices, right? Because it is somehow obvious from the context. Well, it is going, you know, for example, if you see the sum over k, well, then, you know, Typically, it is about all possible values of K uh, that these arrays do have, right? And so one of the reasons of, 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 of what we have been proposing and what APL has been proposing is uh, essentially you use combinators to get rid of this problem of in indexing. But that's not how these people think. This is not how these people express themselves. You just look at the papers, they, they, they love indices, they just don't bother to specify the bounds. Right, so the question is, how can we mimic this? And in, in, in a way, you could say, well, this is, this is trivial, right? Isn't, well, what, what is Bodo talking about? You know, isn't that just array comprehensions? Or you know, if you allow me a little peek into uh, next week's presentation, isn't that just getting to the point, as the DEX people would say, right? So what is, what is an array comprehension in the classical context? What is available if you look into Haskell, Julia, in one form or the other, syntax is slightly, slightly different. But in general, the idea is very simple. You say you have an expression, whoops, uh, whoops, there we go. Uh, you have an expression here, 
why is this mouse? Ah, oh, there it is. Um, you have an expression here, and this expression can refer to some generator variables. And then on the right hand side, you essentially declare what values these indices should have. Um, and roughly that's it, right? So um, you specify the lower bounds and you specify the upper bounds. Uh, typically, you also, uh, well, the, we, you, you, it inherently typically is has some sequentiality, okay? And last not least, you typically have to specify how you want to compose them or whether you want to have the uh, Cartesian product or whether you want to have them uh, uh, running up in sync. Uh, and that's it. So how close are we if, we if we do this kind of thing really, right? So let's look at a few almost trivial examples, right? So matrix transposition. So in essence, the mathematician would say, yeah, yeah. In the transposed, we have ij equals a of ji. Um, what's there to specify, right? Well, if you if you want to use a typical array comprehension and define a function transpose that does this, well, then you have to well you you have to say well, well this is my expression so this is essentially the right hand side from here, and then you have to specify what the i and j are from, right? Because after all. You know we are programming language, so we have to be we have to be precise enough. So then we have to say, okay, I ranges from zero to well to where does it range? Well, we have to to somehow refer to well the shape of a, right? At least that's the the lingo that you typically have in real programming languages. That you say the shape of an array is a vector of the maximum values of in all dimensions. Right, so we have the shape of eight of one. That is the second dimension. I assume we, we start indexing with zero. And then we have to say, well, yeah, what is the range of J? We can do this. So here on the right-hand side. And then typically we have to indicate that these are orthogonal to each other. Some languages, like if you look at Dax or Julia, this is implicitly always the case, but other languages you have more flexibility. Yeah. Is that a good resemblance? For someone who's used to, to read in terms of comprehensions and to, and to think in terms of comprehensions, maybe it is. Um, but I doubt that it is for a scientific programmer. So, okay, uh, we kind of noticed that in, I don't know, uh, early 2000s or even before that. And so even set version 1.0 already has something like that. And so what we do is, first of all, we swap around the generator variable and the expression. So we say ij goes to a of ji. Uh, and essentially, really, the reason for, for this funny swap is that we want to mimic this notation. Another thing that you may notice is there, there are no, no, no ranges, right? There's no lower bound, no upper bound. It's not there. How can we do this and, and still have some half meaningful semantics? Well, in essence, what we do is we do an inference. And the way we do that is we say, okay, if you use these variables inside of selections, then actually we assume that you want to go over the entire range there. Uh, and that's the default that we do. So as soon as you have an expression like this, it can be just in a sub expression or whatever, it doesn't matter. We inherently add in essence, the knowledge that was available or was specified over here. That's, it's just kind of a, you could say almost just a trick, but this trick is very, very convenient because for many, many examples that already holds. Now, with this syntax, we immediately already indicate as well that we assume these to be indices indices uh, into an, an index space, into a rectangular index space. So orthogonal composition is, is, is fixed, kind of. And then we also solve the problem that we can't have uh, sequentiality in the generator because uh, we map this into our 
with loop construct, which is a data parallel construct. And therefore we have a parallel computation specified there and then. Um, Jer Jeremy, do you want me to, to hop into the question from Adam? Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry, yeah. struggling to find the right microphone there. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> so Adam is asking uh, whether the bound inference is type driven uh, or syntax driven. Well, in, in this case, it is, uh, well, in a way, you could say it's a combination of both, right? Because the uh, it is syntax driven, driven in the sense that it has to find the selection. Once it has found the selection, it it, it uses the type. But we come to it, it, things become a little bit more complicated in the extension that I'm going to talk about, uh, or which, which makes up the main point of, of the presentation today. Right, so here, this is a, this is a trivial thing. Let's look at another, uh, at, at another example, totally trivial again. Uh, so let's assume we want to do element-wise addition, but now I don't want to even specify uh, uh, how many axes my array has, right? So in, in general, I would like to say, okay, you know, I want to have addition over all the elements of an array. And if you if you look at mathematical texts, they typically uh, very elegantly go away with it. Uh, just putting these tiny little arrows over here, I hope you can even just see them on the screen, right? Indicating that these are no longer scalar thingy me bobs, but they are vectors now. And uh, that's it, you know, why should you say anything more? Now, how can you do this in a classical array comprehension? Well, that's kind of complicated because typically you don't have selections that you can, uh, where you can provide entire vectors here. Hmm, so, well, in a way you, you can get away with it because what you can do is you can, still write it like so, and then assume that this is a recursive call, right? So really what happens instead of, while well, this you can consider in a scalar addition, this is now kind of a recursive call which recurses over the dimensions. And you say only if you break down to a scalar addition, then it is the scalar addition. And so it's a kind of a, yeah. You, uh, it, it's kind of a divide and conquer thing. If you really implement it that way, it becomes a, a bit of a nightmare because obviously you, you, you would have nested to recursive calls and uh, you would have to figure out and then your parallelism and, you know, but I don't want to talk about that. I restrict to myself to uh, purely syntax. Now, in SAC, we, one of our goals is productivity of the programmer. This is absolutely in the foreground of, of the things that we do. So one of the things that we very, very early on adopted is the idea of shape polymorphism, that you can define functions that op operate on arbitrary shapes. So we would like to be able to express this. And we do. And the idea that we have developed there is we say, okay, if you leave our brackets here, on the left-hand side, but just use a, a variable, then in essence, this is always considered to be a vector. Now, how long is this vector going to be? Well, it is the maximum reasonably possible here. So we, again, uh, you know, look at the syntax, how is the index vector being used? And from that, we derive how long it needs to be. And we always take a greedy approach. Now that gives us, in essence here, the direct transliteration of the thing above. Yeah, so what we have is we can, in, in fact, this is now a scalar edition. And uh, that is a vector of indices. And the, the length of this vector really, really depends on the arguments here. Now, under the hood, I can already uh, give you give away here, uh, we have just opened Pandora's box. Right? It feels like it is a very natural thing to do, but um, it, it has some implications on the way how you can implement these things and how you can even specify an appropriate semantics of these things, right? Now, if you want 
to have a recursive descent like you have here, you can still do that as easily as before. Uh, all, in essence, all you really need to do is you need to put brackets around here. And then it is rather clear that this is, is just a one dimensional index. Uh, if you wanted to have at least two dimensions, then you could do I comma J and you, know, you could have it any which way. So it's not that we have sacrificed expressiveness here, but we have actually gained expressiveness. And we, as you will see in a minute, we will have to pay for this in terms of um, how we give the entire thing some semantics. Bodo, there are a couple of questions mm -hmm. in the chat. James Demel asks about sparse vectors and Michal Gajda, I guess, asks about what if the shapes don't match? Yes, so uh, first, the, the sparse vectors is a unfortunately very sparse answer. Uh, we just don't allow them and we don't support them. Um, so if you want to have sparse arrays, you have to mimic them in classical ways like, you know, content, compressed row, compressed orish or whatever uh, zoo formats you want to use in order to do that. Um, when, if you have different ranges, so what we do is we take the minimum of the ranges uh, provided that at least the dimensionalities are the same. So uh, if, uh, if, if these were differently dimensioned, arrays of different dimensionality, we would reject the program. Um, and if, uh, but if you have different shapes, then we take the minimum of the, the element wise minimum of the shapes. But there is already a problem that you, in a way you are, uh, you're, you're uh, encroaching upon, and that is um, one may have different ideas how this should behave. So it would be nice if you want to have a different behavior that you can do something about it. And in the old version that I'm still talking about, the set notation, uh, that was not possible. Uh, if you don't like it the way it is, then you would have to use with loops, uh, which are way more powerful, but then are also way more ugly. Right. Nevertheless, uh, using this syntax um, uh, allows you to almost directly transliterate uh, these physics uh, examples. So this is, as you can see, uh, very poorly uh, cut out from the paper uh, a formula that you see here. This is a time loop. And as is uh, commonly very often done, if you have a time loop, then you have the upper indices to, uh, to, to kind of indicate the, the versions in the iteration. So this is the previous time step and we compute the new time step here. Now, how can we express this? Well, we say A at position J, well, becomes the old G times, well, we have a sum. What does the sum iterate over? Oh, it iterates over K, yes. And I, my mouse is tricking me again. Where is the mouse? There we go. Uh, we iterate over K and then we compute way WJK times A of K. And uh, then we add B of J here at the end to, uh, uh, to, to this sum and that's it. That's a one-to-one -one transliteration almost. And it is completely legitimate because we can infer all the ranges. We can infer the range of K. It has to be uh, over the shape of the entire of, of entire W. It has to be over the entire shape of A. And a nice benefit of this kind of shape inference, or bound inference, I should say, is that we make sure that we can't produce out of bound selections, right? We just take the minimum of those two. And um, we, we also see that we have uh, sufficient knowledge about J, so the compiler will be happy to do that. Yeah, uh, Rishio is asking what happens if they are not uh, uh, the full array. Um, that means if you don't want the default behavior, we need to be able to do something. So that uh, is, is exactly uh, the thing that we are coming coming to up towards. So please stay tuned uh, uh, for two more slides, I think. So let's look at concatenation. Simple thing, we have two vectors, A and B, and we want to concatenate them. First A, then B. 
how can we express this? Well, we can say, okay, at every index position I, well, it now depends, are, are we on the left side? Um, so is I smaller than len of A, then it is A of I, uh, or are we, do, are we on the right side? Then we just select from B. Now I use len here because I need to have scalar values. So len essentially is the shape at the first position. Now just for the readability of the slide here. Now this is ugly, um, you know, for various reasons. Uh, the conditional is ugly. I don't like to have conditionals in there, uh, simply for the reason that this typically is a data parallel execution loop and I don't really want to have conditionals there. Um, another problem that arises is that here our bound inference will fail. So it's neither, neither good nor practical. So that's the reason why we always kept uh, alongside the set notation uh, our with loops, because we said, well, sometimes you need more flexibility. You know? So this is uh, uh, what inspired us to say, okay, maybe we can push the set notation. And, and this is uh, what happened essentially two years ago when uh, set notation was upgraded to tensor comprehensions. Um, essentially, the idea is we just add more flexibility in the way we can describe things. So here you can see the key things. The first key thing is we can have more than one definition. Now, the idea is the definitions are executed in the order from top to bottom, right? So in a way, uh, first and foremost, we try to execute this and only if that can't be executed, then we execute this. There's one special thing about it and that is the, the range of the final one will define the range, the size of the overall thing. And the other thing that we have added here is the, the part in green on the right-hand side. And here you see, we, we are now allowed to specify a bound. So if we need it, well, why not allow it? So here we say the overall shape is, well, the shape of A plus the shape of B. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, we say, while you have legitimate elements in A, you just select those. Uh, and only thereafter, you just select from B and you just use the same formula as you used here. That is, you just take, make a, uh, a uh, how should I say, adjusted selection into B. Now, obviously this can potentially bring back out of bound errors and but we have machinery to deal with that anyways. And yes, we don't have an inference running here, but we have an inference still running there. It's kind of rather minimal. At the same time, we, we how should I say, we, we hide our conditional or the conditional potentially goes away. So it becomes much clearer that we have one segment that comes from A, one segment that comes from B and what the conditions are. If you wanted to, you can specify ranges here and there as well. Yeah, you can also specify that, for example, the, the lower bound of I has to be the shape of A. Yeah, you, sure, you can do that. This is just a kind of a minimal notation. So really, it is the idea to, to, to take the expressiveness that we have in our with loops, combine it with the beauty of the set notation and create something way more powerful, which ultimately should be able to to uh, uh, substitute uh, with loops in, in user written programs completely. Right, so is that even possible? Because the with loops are, are rather beasty thingies. Beasty in the sense of they, they, they have a lot of expressiveness, but that comes for some clumsiness in, in their syntax. And so I will briefly give you an idea of what they look like for those of you that are not familiar with SAC. So in essence, in a with loop, you already have the notion that you have partitions, like you have 
the partition of, of the overall index space by individual generators, as we call them. Right? So you have lower bound and upper bound, and you have some more ways to, to, to restrict those. You can associate expressions with these ranges. And then overall, you have something like the, the overall shape. And we have something which is called a default expression. And the default expression is the idea that, well, if something does not, if you have an index that doesn't fall into any of these partitions, but that is still within the shape, then we, we need to do know what to do. And this is what, what then the default expression is. Now, we can transliterate this one-to-one -one into a tensor comprehension down here. Uh, the fun part is that the default expression actually can be chucked in here. Um, the, the shape can appear as a restriction in there. And that's how we can not only define this, but also implement it rather elegantly. We just have to transliterate this into that and we're done. So we have a semantics definition and an implementation almost for free, provided we have this mapping. Now, the, the big, big, big difference is that we have made almost everything that is unpleasant to write optional. Optional up to the capability of the compiler to infer it. And this is where the edit value of, of tensor comprehensions come in. This is where uh, we try uh, to, to make it as convenient as possible to the program. And it is the, 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 what I particularly like about the design of these tensor comprehensions is that, for example, the bound inference could be extended to be more smart, you know, if you, for example, have uh, uh, accesses where you have not A of the index position, but A of the index position plus or minus some constant, you could infer useful values there and you could extend it to arbitrary um, sophistication. You know, even if you have, for example, if you would have a more sophisticated type system that would give you more information about certain arguments or certain behaviors of functions, then you could leverage that and just make it smarter. Um, now, I said earlier that uh, with the gener generality that we have, um, I, we have opened Pandora's box. And uh, I have thought, thought for quite a while to, to uh, how to present this in a non too technical way. And I think the best example I can come up with is the take function, surprisingly. So the take function is, uh, well, it's a simple thing. It's, in essence, you, you just specify a shape that you want to take uh, from the array A and uh, uh, you take all the elements accordingly. Hmm. So what's, what's the big, big deal about it? Well, the big deal about it is that in take, at least in, in, in languages like APL, and so in, in our definition of take, we do not require the length of the shape to, be, to match exactly the dimensionality of A. So if the, if the, uh, the, uh, the, so the, the take vector here is shorter in the dimensionality. We just we just take everything uh, from the lower dimensions that are not mentioned in A. That matches very well because you know we take the the, the typical uh, the mathematics of arrays uh, uh, a la Malin, and that means if you if you select in an array with too too few indices, you essentially select the entire hyperplane uh, that is below it. Right, and we can write it beautifully. Okay, so at this point, if you haven't turned off, you may think like, hey, well, now he has lost it. Now, what can possibly be complicated about this? Well, I can tell you, um, if you have a, 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 an algebra on your arrays, then you have funny, the funny notion that you can have empty shapes, uh, but you can have, infinitely many empty arrays. So the, the example that you can think of is, is this example. We, we take 
zero from an array A, but the array is, is an array that has a shape zero two, uh, is it, is zero, <laughs> zero seven. Yeah. Who can read as clearly advantage to, right? So how can this happen? Well, in essence, the way you can think of is if you have a matrix uh, um, and the, the matrix has a shape, say the, the matrix has shape 20 by seven, and you subsequently take away rows, you would like to maintain the property that you expect the, uh, the, the length of the row to be seven. And that is something that it, uh, essentially all algebras that uh, array algebras that I'm aware of maintain, that you have this notion of infinitely many empty arrays that can contain shape. Now, how do you implement this? How do you infer that here, if this thing is empty, it's never executed, what is the shape of that? I mean, S is given, yeah, S is, is just zero. But if it's zero, how do you make this consistent? How do you ensure that really the result is zero seven, the shape of the result? So the, why don't we run into this problem with with loops, right? Because you can express it in a with loop and in a with loop, everything is explicit. You have to write, uh, 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 you have to write, write down everything. So why don't we have the problem there? Well, I can tell you, we do have the same problem there. Uh, that's why actually we have to have a default element for precisely that reason. Because if all your, all your generators are empty, you still have to know what is the shape of the thing, right? So essentially the default expression is missing. Now you could say, okay, how can we resolve this problem? Well, maybe from the types, right? Now with the types, the problem is, well, the type system in SAC is not a fully dependent type system. So we can't even express this. Many other array languages can't express this either because you need to have here really the shape of the result depends on the value of uh, essentially this S. Now, as soon as you start nesting these things, um, you are done, you're toast. Now this is, this, this is really... Uh, quite a challenge to nevertheless give this expression a meaningful, uh, uh, a, a, well, a meaningful meaning, a proper meaning. So what we have done is we have developed an inference that in essence transforms something like this into an expression like that, right? And what you see here is we say, yes, it goes up to S and uh, actually, he, he is missing that IV is smaller than S. But here we have an expression that just gives us, uh, that computes essentially the shape. Because we have a drop of the shape of S of the shape of A that gives us the remaining shape. So it's essentially it gives us this seven here. And that means we can derive the shape. But Boda, the problem here is, the the line the consider line um, is supposed to give you an empty array, and you're you're worrying about how to work out that this is an empty array of width seven, it, empty yes. matrix of width seven or something. It is. It, no, I have to figure out that the shape of the result mm. is zero seven. Yeah. Right. Even if the argument, for example, is uh, uh, is twenty seven, the result is zero seven, and this has to, to come out somewhere. So you don't well, you don't maintain sh shapes as type information. You uh, you if you've got no elements, obviously you, I think obviously you can't work out that it's an empty array of size seven rather than an empty an empty matrix of width seven rather than an empty matrix of width eight. But you, 
the, the, the difficulty that you cannot do this in general, because if you look at the take function itself, then the shape of the, re, uh, of the result of the take function depends on the value of its first argument. So if you want to infer all the shapes, uh, you, have to, you have to have either fully dependent types and then you have to encode it accordingly, or you have to find, if you, if you don't have fully dependent types, you have to live with the fact that you, you may not be able to, 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 to decide this on beforehand. Right. And uh, even then later, it is difficult because I have to tell the compiler what to do here. I have to say, okay, well, it, it, I can clearly tell that this is zero, uh, but how can I compute even this seven? I can't, even dynamically, I can't. I really need to have this expression here for the compiler to figure that out. This seems, so, it seems like a roundabout way of saying the, the width is seven or whatever it is. Yeah, it is, it, 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 but it's, it, Yes. Well, in, in a way, it is a roundabout way of saying uh, what happens if, if this thing is empty. And it somehow needs to be declared. And I don't want to force the programmer to do this for a very egoistic reason. I mean, I've been writing several uh, standard library functions in SAC, and you, know, you have to write these complicated default elements just for the boundary cases. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, one way would, to do it would be to have a fully dependent type system and then you could do it, but then you have to, you know, do all the proofs that you need in order to get your program to run. So the question was, can we do this at all? And uh, the, the, the key idea uh, or the, the bottom line is yes, we can. Uh, without even uh, uh, going as far as having dependent the types or anything. Uh, and uh, I think that, to me, that is, is, is rather beautiful, actually. Um, so in essence, what we do is we take this uh, and then we start out with a very stupid approach. We say, okay, let's assume A is not empty which that may not be true, but let's assume this. Well, if you assume this, then we would write an expression like this, right? We would write generate, well, and then the shape is the shape of, of this thing here. And uh, well, uh, well, what is this thing? Well, I know the index vector is as long as S. And um, so let's assume it has at least one element and that is the minimal index. And so the minimal index is zero times S. So I select this and I just need to know the shape of that. And then I need to know what is the, the zero element of the data type of A and I can write it like so. Now this is, this in principle works unless A is empty because if A is empty, then I have an out of bound access here. So I can't really write this program. I mean, I can, uh, but in, in, the, in the case that we're really interested in, it wouldn't work. But then the question is, maybe we can come up with a rewrite rule that allows us to, to kind of figure out whether we can figure out the shape of the selection without actually being required to do the selection. And that's what, what we do. And effectively, uh, truth to be told, uh, we manifest some laziness here. Um, and I will talk about that briefly, briefly at the very end. So in essence, what we do is we figure out, we can compute the shape of this expression. Uh, and the shape of this expression is actually nothing but a drop of a shape of S of shape of A. And we can mechanically do that. And likewise, we can mechanically find out that if, if the zero function here does not depend on the values, but essentially just on the type of A. Uh, so then we can rewrite the zero function by just the constant zero and we're done. No, how do we give you a little bit more of that uh, in order to, oops, doing that actually is, is much harder than one might think, right? So here's the expression that we want to rewrite. Um, and then the first thing is we need to figure out how much do we need to know about this expression so that we know the shape of this expression. 
And it turns out we have such a thing already uh, published, I don't know, donkey years ago, IFL 2005, right? There it was about how far do we have to drive partial evaluation to find out the shapes of everything. Uh, and that analysis can be used here. And all that this analysis says, it says, yeah, if you want to know the shape of the uh, result of a selection, you just need to know the shape of the array you select from and the shape of the index that you use, right? And with this information, then we can actually develop a, a formal rewrite system that rewrites programs such that for every program I can now create kind of a derivative for every function, I could create a derivative that either just computes the shape or just the dimensionality. So actually then I can rewrite this thing as using my shape computation derivative of the selection, which then only obtains the needed information that is the shape of S and the shape of A. And uh, the rewrite, the formal rewrite of the selection delivers us that this is just drop of shape of S from shape of A. Now, if you're interested in the formal details, we have published that in IFL 2019. Uh, there you can see the rules and you can see the derivation and why this, uh, why this all works. Once this works, we can actually derive from this expression, that expression down here. Now, you may notice that this is a funny thing, right? This expression here, assuming that A is, is, is uh, say of sh shape 0, 19, yeah? Uh, this expression up here contains an out of bound axis. This expression doesn't. <gasps> so we have transformed a, 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 an erroneous program into a non erroneous program. How is that even possible? Well, we have essentially tacitly broken the semantics. Well, what we have done is we have actually introduced some laziness. We have thrown away the need to compute uh, all the elements here by figuring out that we can compute the information that we really want, that is the shape, uh, just from the shapes. So we have actually, really strictly speaking, um, sharpened or loosened, depending on which side of the divide you're sitting on, our, our semantics. It has become a little bit more lazy. And that would mean that if, you know, to, it, that, that opens up a, a very interesting prospect. You know, we can now redefine our semantics uh, no longer to be strictly strict, but slightly lazy. Um, but with this static rewrite, we get this laziness for free. Right? It's, it's free laziness that we essentially obtain by 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 this rewrite, which you can see as a partial evaluation of the program, but it would be guaranteed by the semantics to happen. But this is our future work, and it's just a an, an, an outlook uh, to be mentioned at the at the boundary. So I think it 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 is a, a very cool notation. I hope I I have uh, uh, brought that across, uh, where you can do uh, express things very close to mathematical notation or scientific notation, if you want to say so. Um, the expressiveness uh, has to be paid for by the way you can do inference. Um, um, but uh, it, it, it opens also interesting avenues into a new definition of, of the semantics of, of SAC as well. That kind of brings me to the end of the talk. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I think, uh, we can have uh, uh, just as a, uh, should I say, as a little thing at the end, what we can do is we can, I can show you this in, in action, right? So uh, here uh, I have a, a Jupyter notebook, which essentially is a very simple Jupyter notebook that we have developed in the context of SAC to be able to 
uh, to do this kind of demonstration. Um, I have uh, imported all the basic array stuff and I can write expressions like, like this one, iota 16. And if I execute this, um, if I execute this and my computer figures out that I want to play with this shell again, right? Then I, 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 uh, I get a printout. I see the shape of this thing, and I, I see that it's, that it's fifteen. Now I can what I what I can do is I can put this into a variable. So I can do uh, this here, for example, put this into a variable, and then I can refer to this variable. So I can say something like, no, I first of all I want to turn this into a matrix. So it is the matrix now, and the matrix is a four by four matrix of this A, all right, so this, there we go. Now I can look at M, I can look at M, uh, and we see it's a four by four matrix of exactly those same values. Uh, if I want to, if I want to do something, if I want to transpose this thing, then I can just say, for example, I J becomes um, A of no, not A, better M M of um, J I, right? And uh, uh, this is the transpose. Not not a big deal, um, but I can also use I can also use the uh, uh, index a vector version if I want to right and well now I have to reverse all the entries here right so I do a reverse of IV and now naive as I am I uh, try to do this but then it says to me okay sorry our magic is not good enough anymore uh, we can't infer the upper bound please give it to me no? Okay, and that is because, well, I have hidden the, the use of, of IV is now no longer in a selection, it's in a reverse. So I actually here have to tell the system that IV is smaller than um, uh, the, uh, what is it then? Um, uh, do I have to take the... Shape uh, of M? Well, don't I have to take the reverse of the shape of M? I think I have to take the reverse of the shape of M, am I not? Uh, uh, do the rever yes, uh, reverse of uh, shape of M, I would think. I hope that I got the, the brackets right. And yes, it is still working. Now, it is not just working uh, actually for our M. What we have done is under the, under the hood is if we, have, um, we have changed uh, our our transpose definition slightly. It is slightly more generic because we can also apply it to our vector that we still have up there. Um, and uh, well, there is just idempotent, right? And we can uh, we can also obviously uh, we can also apply it to a three dimensional thing. So let's define let's redefine a to be a three dimensional thing or yes or maybe even a four dimensional thing. Why not? Let's make it a uh, let's make it a well balanced tie um, like so plus one right so. Now, just to give you the A here, right? So it is now a two by two by two by two by two matrix. And we can see, uh, so this is the, the outer axis, uh, zero, one. Uh, the second axis, zero, one. Um, if you see my cursor, that is. Um, right, and now we should be able to actually execute this thing. And uh, so we can transpose it. And this is a very exciting transpose because essentially uh, you can see that the, the, the nine now, instead of being at index um, one, zero, 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 is at uh, index uh, zero, 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 one. No, because we have just swapped, we have just swapped the, um, uh, 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 the decision points. Right. So here you see the power 
that derives from the ability to actually capture the entire thing here. Uh, now, I, I leave it uh, open for you to figure out uh, uh, how to compute the default element here and how that would look like. I think I've, I've uh, exhausted uh, uh, my time. Um, if there's any more questions or if people want to see any more experimentation, I'm happy to do this. Thank you. <laughs>